Salam everyone. Welcome back to Kalima Taiba series. I hope you are taking advantage of the most important 10 days of the year, the first 10 days of the Hijrah. Today, I will talk to you about the singular most important day of the whole year. What day do you think that is? No, it's not your birthday. The most important day of the whole year is the ninth day of the Hijrah, the day of Arafah. We're going to find out what's so special about this day and how can we prepare for it. Now, you already know that the days of the Hijjah are the days of Hajj, when Muslims go visit the house of God, Baytullah, Al-Kaaba, in the most sacred place on earth, which is Mecca al-Mukarramah. Going to Hajj is an annual trip that Muslims take to go meet their Lord. These are the days of connection with God, Ayyamul Wisa. You need to know that the most beautiful moments anyone can pass through are the moments when they meet the most beloved person to them. Imagine there's someone you love, truly love, and you haven't seen them for a long time. How would your union be? If you describe the moments when you first see them after a long period being apart, it would be one of the most emotional and touching moments of your life. For the true believers, the most amazing moment is the moment when they meet their Lord, whom they love and adore. And the Hajj trip is a way of preparing yourself for this moment, the moment you meet your God. These moments have three levels. The first level happens in this life. For the true believers, the most beautiful thing in this life is Al-Ihsan. It is feeling that you are with Allah and He is with you at all times. Remember the two pillars of Ihsan? Worship God as if you see Him, and if you don't see Him, know that God sees you. People who reach that state become in the Divine Presence, which brings them to the highest level of happiness anyone can ever reach in this life. The second level happens when you die, because when you die, you meet your Creator, Allah, and this is the most beautiful thing about death. The third level happens in Paradise, and it is when you see God, when you see the face of your Lord. And this is the ultimate level. So the trip of Hajj is the experience that will train you so you become ready and well prepared for these moments. Now, I know that most of us, if not all of us, can go to Hajj this year because of the current circumstances. But I will give you two small hacks that can make you benefit of Hajj as if you were there. First of all, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us, Actions are by intentions. So if you put in your mind the niyyah, the will and the intention of going to Hajj, but you are not able to because of external factors that are beyond your control, then Allah will reward you with the benefits of Hajj, especially when you take advantage of those 10 days, just like we, just like we talked about in our last lesson. Second of all, you know that we are made up of body, heart and soul. So even if physically you were not able to attend Hajj, don't stop your heart and soul from doing Hajj. This year, we will go to Hajj with our heart and soul. Let's make the intention, niya. let's do the work and the preparation, and let's hope for God's mercy and rewards. Last time, we talked about the importance of the 10 days of the Hajjah, how we should take advantage of them by avoiding doing bad deeds and by increasing our Amal Saleh, the good actions, since every good action is multiplied by 700. We talked about the importance of fasting. Fasting one day equals the fasting of one year, and the qiyam and prayer during the night, during these 10 days, equals Laylatul Qadr, the night of Qadr, which in itself equals a lifetime. All these acts are in preparation for the day of Arafah, the day you stand before God and you talk to Him. But before you do that, you need to prepare, right? This is the most important meeting you'll ever have, the meeting with your Creator. That's why. The day number eight, just before the day of Arafah, is called the day of Tarwiyah, and this is the day you should prepare yourself for meeting with God. On that day, people gather in groups and start to, to prepare what they will say to God when they meet Him the next day. They would be in a fearful and stress, stressful state, worried about how their meeting will be. And this should remind you of the day of judgment, when all humanity gathers from the first human being created, Prophet Adam, till the last human being alive waiting for judgment time to begin. And during this time, each one of us will be thinking of the moment they will stand before God for the reckoning, al-hisab. And Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us, Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Take yourselves to account before you are taken to account. So listen carefully. When you meet Allah, there are two scenarios that could happen. You can try and brainstorm all the good deeds you have done in your life, make a list of them, and when you meet God, you start enumerating them, hoping that your good deeds will make you eligible to enter paradise. So you would start thinking of the times you prayed, you fasted, 
you did charity, you helped someone, you read Quran, and you start feeling good about yourself. Oh, I have done some good things. I feel I deserve paradise. And this is totally wrong. This is the biggest mistake you can ever do. When you meet God, the worst thing you can do is to start talking about the good deeds you have done in your life. Let me tell you why. The good deeds you do in your life are not accepted unless they abide by the following rule. The rule of la ilaha illallah. There's no God except Allah. Which also means there's no giver except Allah. La ma'ti illallah. There's no doer except Allah. La fa'ila illallah. There's no guide except Allah. La muwaffiq illallah. The prayer you did in your life is a gift from God to you. The fasting, the charity, the Quran reading, all are a gift from Allah to you. So you're not the one who fasted and prayed and did all of those good actions. These actions were bestowed to you by the one and only Allah. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Wallahi, mahtadayna, wala sumna, wala sallayna. By Allah, without you, we would not have been guided. Neither would we have fasted, nor would we have prayed. The Prophet is saying that without Allah, we would not have done any of our good deeds. So how, how can we rely on those deeds to deserve paradise? Now, if you cannot rely on the good deeds that we do, how are we going to enter paradise? And that's a good question. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us, none of you will enter paradise by his deeds alone. His companions asked him, not even you, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet answered them, not even me, unless Allah grants me his mercy. That's why it is so wrong to come and enumerate your good deeds when you meet Allah. Then what should you talk about when you meet him? What, sh what should you say? First, you should remember your mistakes. Count your mistakes and your wrongdoings you did in your life. Remember how when you prayed, you started thinking of many other things other than Allah. Remember how many moments you stayed in ghafla, in forgetfulness, and you were not conscious of Allah, and feel sorry and repent. And then Allah will ask you, didn't you pray? Didn't you fast, O son of Adam? You would answer, yes, I did, but it was all from your mercy and kindness. You allowed me to do these deeds, and if it wasn't for you, I would not have done anything. Then Allah would tell you, didn't you give charity and read Quran? Didn't you go to Hajj? You would say, yes, I did, but all because of you. You were the one who honored me to visit your house and read your words, and I didn't do anything. This is the way to talk to Allah when you meet him. You should not boast about the good deeds you did. You should instead remember your mistakes and your shortcomings, and you should be humble. And this way, you will feel your need for him to forgive you. And when you do that, he will shower you with his mercy, his forgiveness, and his kindness. And he will forgive all your sins and wrongdoings. And he will forgive all your shortcomings and forgetfulness. If you do that on the day of Arafah, the day you meet with God, you will understand the greatness of Allah the greatness of his mercy and the immensity and of his generosity and forgiveness. To be able to do that, you need to prepare for your meeting with God. And this is done the day before Arafah, the day of Tarwiyah. What I advise you to do is to go over the list of virtues and major sins that you can find on Kalima Taiba page. You will find a list of the virtues of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Go over the list and check which of these virtues are lacking in you. For example, the virtue of don't get angry. Hmm, I still have to work on that. Highlight it. The second virtue, do not speak of what you don't know and do not spread unverified information. Okay, I still need to work on that too. So go over the list and make a list of the virtues that you still didn't acquire properly and put them aside. Similarly, check the list of kabair, which are the major sins. Go through them and pick the ones that you're still struggling with and put them aside. It could be arrogance, holding a grudge. You pick the ones that you still need to work on. This is what you need to talk to Allah about on the next day. You want to tell him that there are some virtues that you still can't implement properly. And there are some sins that you're still struggling with. So you want his help and his forgiveness. So you make a checklist and a plan on how to work on yourself to acquire the virtues of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that you are still lacking. And a plan on how to start avoiding the sins that you're still falling into. And you ask Allah for his guidance, his forgiveness, and you ask him to give you the strength to worship him the right way. Now, if you come on the day of Arafah without your checklist, without having prepared anything, it is like the person who goes to an exam without studying for it. It's good he showed up for the exam, but he's clueless. You don't want to be in that state when you meet Allah. You need to be ready and prepared, and prepared so you can win his love when you stand before him. 
Now, what are the virtues of the day of Arafah? On the day of Arafah, we said it's highly recommended to fast. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that fasting on that day will expiate the sins of the previous and upcoming years. Imagine having all the sins of the previous and coming year erased. On this day, angels will go down to earth in great numbers to see and witness the meetings of every human being with his Lord. The Prophet وسلم, said, no day is better to Allah than the day of Arafah. There is no day when God sets free more servants from hell than the day of Arafah. He draws near, then he boasts to the angels about his servants, saying, What do these want? Ma arada ha'ula? Allah is saying to the angels, What is it that these servants of mine are asking me for, so that I may grant it to them? Look at my servants. They came from all around the world, covered in dust and looking disheveled. They're calling upon me, hoping for my mercy. Now, even if we can be physically present on the mountain of Arafah, let us fast on that day and join, join those people with our hearts and prepare for our meeting with God. You can pray to him and talk to him in any language you want. Pray for yourself, but also pray for your family and your loved ones. And don't forget to pray for the Ummah, the nation and the followers of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It is your Ummah, you are part of it, and it is the Ummah of your beloved Prophet. So let the benefit flow, inshallah, because this is the most blessed day of the year. And by the way, there's no day in the year when shaitan is more humiliated and is more in despair than he is on this day, the day of Arafah. Because he sees the people worshiping God and he has been working for his entire existence to, existence to take them away from their creator. But then on this day, in these few hours before sunset, before Maghrib prayer, you call upon Allah and Allah forgives all your sins. Allah puts you back in good ranking and good standing and all of shaitan's efforts to delude you and take you astray go in vain. And he feels completely humiliated. He sees the descent of angels coming upon people and surrounding them. And he sees all of these people forgiven and he knows that he lost his battle with you. I'm telling you, the day of Arafah is the best day of the year. Take advantage of it and make sure you don't miss it. Now we move to the 10th day, Yawm al nahr the day of sacrifice, which is the first day of Eid al-Adha. And we said during this day, we should remember the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. He had a dream in which he was sacrificing his son. And when he told his son about the dream, Ismail alayhi salam accepted the decree of Allah. And he told his father, oh my father, do what you have been commanded to do. And you will find me to be among the patients. Abraham was ordered to kill his son to prove to Allah that he obeys, that he obeys him no matter what, and that he loves him no matter what. Ismail alayhi salam was 15, and he did not hesitate to obey the command of God. Abraham took his only long-awaited child to sacrifice him. What happened then? Shaitan came to the mother of Ismail, the wife of Abraham, Hajar alayhi salam, and he started whispering to her, how can you let your husband kill your only child? This is insane. Go stop him. Hajar was a true believer. What did she do? She took seven stones and threw them at Shaitan. She didn't let the whispers of shaitan affect her. She didn't engage in a conversation with him. She immediately shut him off and the shaitan shrank. And this is why we do Rami Jamarat, which is throwing stones during the 10th day of Dhul Hijjah to remind ourselves to shut the whispers of shaitan. Then shaitan went to Ismail. He whispered to him, you're still a young boy. How are you, how are you gonna let your dad sacrifice you? This is unfair. Ismail immediately took seven stones and threw them at shaitan. He did not engage with him in a conversation. And this is why we do the second Rami Jamarat at the medium pillar, exactly where Sayyidina Ismail faced Shaitan. Shaitan finally went to Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam and he whispered to him, this is your only son. How can you sacrifice him? He is your only boy. This is too much to ask. I'm sure there's another way. And Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam threw at Shaitan seven pebbles. And this is why we do the third Rami Jamarat, exactly at the location where Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam stopped the whispers of shaitan. Sayyidina Ibrahim held his son down to sacrifice him. And when the knife did not cut his neck upon the command of Allah, Sayyidina Ibrahim was ordered to sacrifice a lamb instead. In the shortest chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Kawthar, Allah tells us, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Inna a'tainaka al-Kawthar. Indeed, we have granted you al-Kawthar, abundance. Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice to him, Lord. Inna shani'aka huwa al-abtar. Indeed, your enemy is the one cut off. Allah created you to give you abundance, kawthar, to give you so many good and beautiful things. 
So pray to Allah a prayer of gratitude and sacrifice yourself and your desires and do not listen to the whispers of shaitan. And remember the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We remember the story of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam and we sacrifice a lamb on the 10th day of Dhul Hijjah to remind ourselves that just like Prophet Abraham was ordered to sacrifice his son, we are ordered to kill our desires and sacri sacrifice ourselves for the sake of Allah because we love him. We should not let our whims and desires control us. We shouldn't let the whispers of shaitan get a hold of us. You know, if you don't have desires, shaitan will not be able to whisper to you. So by killing your desires and controlling them, you are cutting off shaitan. So what is Allah emphasizing here for us? And what's the lesson that we can take from this? Every year during Hajj, during these blessed days, we get to exercise and practice our meeting with God, which will be the most beautiful moment for us. When we love Allah, we will remember him and we will worship him during his most favorite days. And we will put his commands above our desires. And we will even sacrifice our desires for his sake. Let your heart be with Allah. Let this year be the year of Hajj of your heart. Do not waste your chance. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.